will be exploring the recently published KMAP Global Ocean Gene Catalog 1.0 and specifically its potential for developing biotechnology applications across medicine, energy, food and more. A brief introduction to Frontiers in Science. This is Frontiers' flagship multidisciplinary open access journal that focuses on the transformational science that accelerates solutions for healthy lives on a healthy planet. The journal publishes invited, peer-reviewed lead articles within a, a within a hub of multi-audience content, and it's designed to build bridges between science, policy, and the general public. So today's deep dive focuses on this lead article, Metagenomic Probing Toward an Atlas of the Taxonomic and Metabol Metabolic Foundations of the Global Ocean Genome. It was published on January the 16th this year. And after a few weeks, has already been featured in great media outlets, including The Guardian, La Repubblica, and the Smithsonian Magazine. In their Frontiers in Science lead article and its hub of complementary content, which I invite everyone here to explore, the authors present the KMAP Global Ocean Gene Catalog, which is the largest open source database of gene sequences from marine organisms to date. This as we understand, highlights an extremely important step towards a global ocean genome. Focusing on marine microbes, the database consists of 317.5 million gene groups from over 2,100 ocean samples, of which just over half can be categorized according to their taxonomy, their function, their geographical location, and their zone and ecosystem. The, auth the authors also use this opportunity to identify several priority areas of research for fully exploring the global ocean genome, and they describe several technological challenges that they'll have to overcome. The article itself is the centerpiece of this hub that also includes an editorial by National Geographic Explorer in Residence, Dr. Enric Seller, a scientific viewpoint article by Professor Andreas Teske at the University of North Carolina, and a policy outlook by Peggy Callas, International Ocean Policy Advisor at the Oceano Azul Foundation, who is also joining us here today. There is also a lay explainer with infographics, there is a video, and also an article in the Frontiers for Young Minds journal, which is a journal for kids. In this deep dive session, You'll hear from many of the contributors joining us today to the Article Hub, and you'll also have the chance to ask your own questions to them directly. So this is today's agenda. We'll be starting off with Professor Carlos Duarte from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST, who will briefly introduce the KMAP Ocean, uh, Global Ocean Gene Catalog, and will be setting the scene for today's discussions. We'll then hear from lead author Elisa Laiolo from KAUST, who will be presenting a deep dive into mapping the global ocean genome. We also have Professor Silvia Athenas from the Spanish National Research Council's Institute of Marine Sciences, and she will be discussing the potential of ocean microbes in blue technology. Professor Josep Gazol, also from the Spanish Institute of Marine Sciences, will be moderating a panel session with our speakers and our, um, our guest panelists. We also have Courtney Nichols Gold, co founder and co CEO at New Atlantis Labs, Peggy Callas from the Oceano Azul Foundation, and last but definitely not least, Dr. Heidi Reskel from the IUCN. And we'll then open the floor for questions uh, from all of you. We'll then close this off with a few final remarks from uh, Carlos himself. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'm very pleased to kick us off with our very first speaker, uh, who is one of the co-leaders of the Frontiers in Science lead article, Professor Carlos Duarte, who is an Ibn Sina Distinguished Professor at KAUST. Carlos is also the field chief editor for Frontiers in Marine Science, is a worldwide leader in biological oceanography and marine ecology, and was named one of the most influential scientists in the world by Thomson Reuters in 2021. He has published over 900 scientific articles and has worked on a range of aquatic environments from the tropics to the polar ecosystems. Since 2021, he has served as the executive director for the Global Coral R&D Accelerator platform, CORDAP, 
and his current research focuses on understanding the effects of climate change in marine ecosystems with the aim of rebuilding marine life by 2050. I hope I gave your introduction good justice there, Carlos. Welcome, and I hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to Frontiers for organizing this wonderful uh, webinar and forum for discussion. And then my role in the minutes that I have allotted will be to provide an overview of the work we, we did, and then uh, Lisa Laiolo will go a bit deeper in the significance of the, of the research. So uh, the global ocean genome, uh, it's really the catalog of life that has evolved in the ocean, not only because it's a cradle of life with uh, 3.9 billion years of evolutionary history, but also because it's the largest uh, habitat on earth with 99% of the inhabitable volume of uh, the biosphere and 71% of the earth's surface. So uh, the exploration of the genetic uh, resources and genetic catalog of the ocean was uh, started in uh, 1996 when the first uh, marine organism was sequenced. That was a uh, Methanocaldococcus uh, janaski. And then uh, as sequencing uh, technologies evolved, then uh, those new technologies allowed to go deeper into the exploration of uh, marine genetic uh, uh, resources. And the first uh, global expedition to explore the global ocean genome was that of the Sorcerer 2 Global Ocean Sampling Expedition that sailed between 2003 and 2004, and then produced the first metagenomic uh, assessment of a marine plankton community that was published by Nielsen and co-authors in 2007. Uh, next generation sequencing technologies then was able to uh, catalyze the exploration of the uh, metagenomes of the ocean and gene catalog of the ocean by reducing costs by up to 4,000 times in a few years and also allowing to uh, go deeper into the taxonomic and functional uh, characterization of the organisms containing the, the gene sequences. Uh, this enabled then the development of global expeditions that were uh, sailing the global ocean to uh, explore the genomic resources of marine organisms with a particular emphasis on microorganisms. So one of the flagship expeditions is the Tara Ocean Expedition that sailed the ocean in the Tara uh, sailboat from 2009 to 2003 and was focused on microbial communities in the upper ocean. So uh, the Tara Ocean Expedition released a catalog of 33.3 million non-redundant uh, genes from about 243 uh, samples collected across 68 sampling sites, most of them from the upper ocean, but some of them from the mesopelagic uh, ocean. Then uh, I led the Malaspina expedition that uh, was a Spanish expedition that sailed the ocean with two research vessels, but one of them, the Sperides, which is in the photograph, then completed a circumnavigation of the ocean, uh, spending about nine months uh, and consistently sampling the ocean down to 4,000 meters depth. And it produced the first uh, global metagenomic assessment for the deep sea. So the Tara Oceans and the Malaspina expedition were coordinated in terms of their sequencing effort. And there were uh, participants that were involved in both expeditions. And then through the combined efforts, then we really made a big contribution to the uh, genomic assessment of the global ocean. And together with many other uh, genome uh, metagenomic sequences that have been deposited over the years, then we uh, produced the Global Microbial uh, Gene Catalog, uh, which expanded, which is uh, reported in the publication Frontiers in Science, that expanded the catalog of marine genes to, uh, to uh, 303 uh, million genes of marine uh, organisms. And eventually led to the, uh, a more thorough exploration of the global ocean genome which we define as the pool of genes that is present in marine uh, organisms and together with the functional information of the functions they encode for that include protein coding genes and also biosynthetic gene clusters that support ocean metabolism and uh, the transformation of organic matter in the ocean. 
So the global ocean genome is an important uh, component of ocean science because it goes beyond just a simple catalog of the functional capabilities of, uh, of organisms and the taxonomic diversity, but it also can provide a unique understanding of biogeochemical cycles, also the evolution of uh, global ocean uh, microbes, and it is in constant change, so it's not just a, a, a a uh, resource and, a, and an inventory of life that is static, static on, on time is uh, responding and changing in response, for instance, to the introduction of synthetic, uh, of synthetic um, uh, uh, chemicals that we introduced in the ocean. And then also uh, can provide uh, elements to be used in biotechnology uh, to resolve multiple problems in society, but also to even advanced marine uh, conservation. So this is all uh, I wanted to uh, to share, but the significance of the marine the genetic resources has been highlighted uh, recently in the uh, agreement on biodiversity between beyond national uh, jurisdictions that calls the BBNJ agreement, which for the first time looks into how we can share the benefits of the genome of the ocean. The Nagoya Protocol governs how genetic resources are, are ruled and are governed in the national territories of countries and also the exclusive economic zone. But up to uh, last year, then we had a gap in how the uh, genetic resources of the high seas could be governed. And then uh, progress has been made in resolving uh, ways into uh, declaring both uh, what samples are being collected, but also establishing a mechanism to share the benefits that derive from the marine genetic resources. So this last slide shows uh, some of the key references used in uh, producing this overview and this uh, rapid journey through the development of uh, marine metagenomics. And with this, then uh, I will give the floor back to the host. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for setting the scene, taking us through uh, that journey in the history of a, of a, a global ocean genome, and um, also for introducing what happens afterwards with the, the BBNJ agreement. Um, so moving on, I'd, I'm really pleased now to welcome our next speaker, Elisa Laiolo, who is another of the co-authors of the Frontiers in Science Lead article. A few words about Elisa. She is a marine biologist and a current PhD candidate at the Red Sea Research Center at KAUST. Her research interest is in microbial ecology with a focus on sediment microbial communities. And using metagenomics, she investigates patterns of microbial diversity, examining functional potential and metabolic adaptations of the communities inhabiting different aquatic habitats. So a very warm welcome to you, Elisa. I'd love to hand over. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. So I'm going to go a little bit uh, more in deep in the specific of uh, our work that you can find on Frontiers in Science. So this uh, presentation will focus a little bit more on the methods, on how we achieved this uh, huge gene catalog presented in the publication. So all the metagenomes included were retrieved for the European Nucleotide Archive and with some uh, specific cutoffs that, um, for example, we decided to use only per end Illumina sequencing technology, a nominal length of uh, more than 100 base pairs, and a base count superior to, uh, to, to 10 to the 8. So, why we decided to use uh, everything from the European Nucleotide Archive? because this is a repository that provides uh, a comprehensive record of the world's nucleotide sequencing information. So basically every, every publication has uh, the requirement of uh, making uh, the base data available. And this is one of the major repositories in the world. Many of the data which is deposited here uh, gets um, not as access anymore after being published. So we wanted to show how this data can still be source of amazing research afterwards, even years afterwards. So how we proceeded to organize and classify this uh, amount of metagenomes. 
We classify them according to their geographical location and their oceanic realm and depth zone. So according to their coordinates, which were available in the repository, we split them among uh, oceans, separating also the Mediterranean Sea, and according to three major uh, depth zones. The upper ocean, which uh, includes everything which was between uh, zero and 200 meters, so the sunlit ocean, we can say, and uh, a little bit below. The classical mesopelagic ocean, so between 200 and 1,000 meters, and then the dark ocean, so everything below that. Uh, this classification got applied for the samples belonging to the pelagic realm, so to the water column ones. The one belonging to the benthic realm, so basically the, the seabed, the sediment ones, were not further splitted since they were uh, in a much lower amount, as we're going to see later. But how we proceeded to reannotate all of this metagenomic data, which is the core of uh, our work. We use uh, a pipeline developed uh, here in KAUS, the institution where uh, I have the luck to study, which is called uh, the KAUS Metagenomic Analysis Platform, KMAP, in, uh, as a, with an acronym. What is the base, the take-home message of uh, this scheme, we can say? The take home message is that uh, there is a huge development of tools uh, in these years because uh, the more and more uh, we sequencing data are provided to us, the more and more there is an increased capacity of uh, better tools to handle them and to reprocess that, uh, re them while technology is improving. And this is what uh, KMAP does. In uh, the bottom left corner, you can see the original publication from uh, 2021. And it consists mostly of two modules that you can see in light blue in the central part of this infographic. The annotation module, which is used for annotation of users' submitted contexts or genes, and then comparison and visualization module, which allows uh, for sample to sample or gene catalog based comparison. So the input can be whatever from a genome, metagenome contexts genes or proteins. Then there can, the reannotation of them or straight annotation can be done. And uh, then there is the second part of uh, the, the, let's say, of the modules of this tool, um, which is uh, the combination and visualization of results one, which can uh, pass through the forms, for example, of chronographs, which are very informative. And then there is a full sample comparison module, where the comparison can be between uh, uh, samples belonging to the same uh, gene catalogs or uh, within one, to one versus one or uh, among gene catalogs included. So, uh, uh, dividing, uh, as we showed before, this is uh, what uh, is included in our study. So at the end, we analyze uh, 2,100 uh, two metagenomes obtained from the European Nucleotide Archive. The, our data set was not fully balanced between uh, pelagic uh, realm and benthic one. More than 95% of the samples belong to the water column, while only less than 5% belong to the benthic realm. Uh, most samples were uh, almost 80% belong to the upper ocean, and uh, which uh, represents, uh, at the, uh, compared to what Professor Duarte introduced before, uh, represent to give you an estimate only 5%, more or less, of the ocean volume, while uh, uh, a little bit more than 7% and 10% belong respectively to mesopelagic and dark ocean. Geographically, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean were the best represented, accounting for 40 and 28% of samples. There was a weak representation of uh, the polar oceans with 5% uh, and 1.5 collected in the, in the Arctic and Southern Oceans respectively, which can be easily explained by the difficulties uh, which you encounter in exploring these uh, very harsh habitats in terms of conditions. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea was uh, 
we decided to assess that separate because uh, accounted for more than 10% of the samples, while it represents only less than 1% of the ocean surface. Of course, uh, is, uh, many, many marine studies institutions are on this basing. That's why it's so, so well studied. Here I highlighted uh, what uh, I introduced before, uh, the, the huge skew of our data set. So Bentic, uh, the Bentic realm needs further exploration for sure, because even if it's one of the more, most important compartments of the ocean uh, is uh, hugely understudied, as you can see from this summary table. And uh, here is, uh, I try to represent uh, in a more uh, visual way what I was, uh, what I was saying before uh, regarding the, the huge bias we have toward the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific one. And uh, yeah, also from this map, uh, you can follow some uh, routes of the main expeditions that introduced by Professor Duarte. Regarding taxonomical insights, uh, um, we we assess the major field, the major groups, taxonomical groups. So uh, archaea, eukaryotes, bacteria, and viruses. And uh, as you can see, they were uh, bacteria were the major players in all of the of the realms and the depth zones. But eukaryotes had uh, accounted for a huge component in the upper ocean, which. Uh, yeah, makes sense given the presence of light and less harsh condition, conditions. Here I highlighted some uh, interesting results regarding eukaryotes, because uh, many times we think about eukaryotes as uh, bigger animals and we never focus on the microbial component uh, of them. But in the mesopelagic ocean, we found that uh, of our uh, gene clusters, uh, more than 50% of the classified as eukaryotic one belong to the phyla fungi, which uh, is very important ecologically speaking. So as many function, some of them uh, known, for example, their role uh, in food webs, their role in uh, being um, part of the, um, of the metabolism of nutrients in the water column, but uh, they have some uh, recently discovered roles uh, or uh, indicated to them, uh, which are, uh, for example, the, the role in um, consuming proteins uh, and uh, putting them back in the food web, especially in uh, deeper strata of the ocean. Functionally speaking, uh, we started from the biggest picture and then we went more in deep, uh, as you can see in the paper, uh, with the uh, omicrobial met metabolism. But the take-off message of the biggest uh, assessment of bright categories, uh, which are huge categories uh, from the CAG database, uh, is that, uh, as you can see, the four main ones, uh, so the one uh, um, for metabolism, genetic information processing, environmental information one, and signaling and cellular processes, processes are pretty balanced among uh, all the depth zones. The only different uh, scenario that we can find uh, is in the benthic realm I introduced before, where there is uh, a huge uh, role played by the, the, one, the gene clusters belonging to metabolism capacities. And uh, this can be explained by the fact that in the benthic realm, we have many different um, conditions. Many times they are harsh, and the biogeochemical gradients are on very small scales. So the micro the microorganism belonging to this uh, to this realm need to show huge adaptivity to different and uh, always changing conditions. So yeah, this was already a very interesting result that led led, led us, as you can see in the discussion of the paper, to go more in deep in the metabolic capacities of microorganisms. Yeah. This work, of course, was part of a huge uh, team effort from uh, taking expertise from uh, different uh, people and benefiting from them, especially organizing everything wouldn't have been possible 
without the previous work of many of many co-authors, like Dr. Intika Balam, which is co-first uh, author, Mahmoud Uludag, uh, professors uh, Taka Takashi Gojobori and Carlos Duarte. But uh, in also discussing them benefited of, uh, these results benefited of all my team. So yeah, huge thanks to them. It was a pleasure working with all of, all of you. I leave uh, the floor back to Gilbert. Thank you very much, Elisa. That was that was fascinating. Um, your deep dive into into the very ambitious project. Congratulations on the article and to all the co-authors. Um, and now we can see Professor Silvia Sassinas is 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 with us today. She's a marine micro uh, microbial bi microbiologist who is another co-author of the Frontiers in Science lead article, and Professor of Marine Microbiology at the Spanish National Research Council's Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, so Sylvia's work focuses on linking microbial genetic diversity with functional capacities using metagenomics and identifying the evolutionary mechanisms underlying diversification processes. And since 2009, she's been the coordinator of a prokaryotic consortium within the Tara Oce uh, Oceans Global Expedition. And they aim to identify the full extent of invisible marine biodiversity. And she also leads Deep Malaspinomics, a project which is working on the large scale sequencing of deep sea ocean samples. So, Sylvia, a very warm welcome to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone, for this nice invitation. It's really nice to be here in this event. First, um, I would like always to introduce a little bit. Uh, and remember that most of the biomass in the ocean is unicellular. Most of the diversity in our planet is microscopic, it's invisible to our eyes. And if we think in the ocean, about 70 and 80 percent of the ocean biomass is formed by little microbes, the microbes of the plankton. And when we talk about the plankton, we basically are referring to the diversity of a, a little unicellular um, um, florids. Uh, Coyotics, uh, some bacteria, some archaea, some fungi, and also some viruses. And because uh, my my expert is more into the bacterial plant, the bacteria in the archaea in the ocean, I always like to remember how these microbes are important. First, because there are many of them. There is uh, just 10 to the 6 uh, cells of prokaryotes per milliliter in the ocean. If you extrapolate this number to the total volume of the ocean, that means this is 10 to the 29 cells of bacteria and archaea in the ocean. Also, it's important to remember that about half of the primary production that occurs in the ocean, many of this fraction is thanks to the cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic bacteria. And also the key role of the respiration in, in, the, in the ocean is microbial. And finally, the, all the bacteria and archaea are key fundamental um, roles in the most of the biochemical uh, cycles in the ocean, for example, carbon fixation, nitrogen fixation, and so on. So my um, few slides now is going to be focused a little bit in the in the exploration, the ocean microbe exploration that um, we have already uh, saw some very nice introduction by, by Carlos Duarte. And especially uh, those expeditions that are focused in the ocean and the microbiome, and uh, particularly in two of them because I was deeply involved. One is Tara Ocean and uh, a second is Malaspin Expedition. Uh, just to remember that Tara Ocean was the pioneers in the exploration on large scale and uh, covering many regions of the oceans in the, in the different uh, latitudes and also uh, covering not only the photic layer, but also the, a little bit of the, the mesopelagic. And it was the first coordinator was uh, Eric Arsentin, and now is uh, Chris Bolo who leads uh, many, many aspects of the, of the Tara Ocean as a scientific coordinator. And also, uh, you will know that Malaspina was led by Carlos Duarte here, but also the analysis of the, of the microbial component, it was led by, by Pep Casol, and also was uh, involved in that, in that part. So both expedition has been really very complementary, not only in time but also in the in the in the output because uh, it, it covers different things. So if we remember, uh, Tara Oceans covers many many part of the of the ocean uh, regions, but also the Arctic. There was uh, really unexplored um, uh, at a very large extent, and uh, the beauty of Tara, I think, is because they cover different plant to say fraction from the viruses to to bacteria, archaea, to, to proteins in different say fraction up to two milliliter uh, 
two, um, two millimeter um, proteins and eukaryotes. So they have this holistic uh, view of the of the microbial. And Malaspina, on the other hand, I think the beauty of this expedition because they cover even they cover different or uh, they cover different uh, ocean regions and also mostly uh, it's true that it's mostly in the temperate and tropical regions. But the beauty of this expedition is they go down to four centimeter depth to the Batipelagic. So it's very complementary in the end both expeditions. And also because both are using uh, metagenomics as a fundamental tool to explore the ocean microbiome. So they could, uh, by, by, by sequencing most of the, of the genes of the microbial community in the ocean, we can extract the cysteine or ribosomal gene to have more, uh, um, more idea about the taxonomic um, relationship of these, of, these, uh, of these micros, but also we can, now we have the power and the, uh, and the bioinformatic uh, capacity to reconstruct genomes directly from the metagenomes. That's why we call uh, metagenomics assembly genome, this max. And then we can explore the fun uh, functional biogeography and, and many things in the, in the ocean. So that's why um, I think this, um, this pioneer uh, you know, expedition was fundamental uh, to explore the ocean microbiome. Again, just to refresh, uh, in Tar Ocean, there was two different gene catalogs. The first one uh, was a 40 million no redundant genes, but it was another one that it was the version two that uh, rise to up to 47 million no redundant genes because it covers also the Arctic Ocean. And also it was uh, in integrating uh, many metatranscriptons as well. On the other side, uh, we also been involved uh, deeply in the Malaspina, and we have also released two different gene catalogs. The first one is what we call the Malaspina gene database. That is all the samples of the station belongs to 4,000 meter depth. It's all from the Batipelagic uh, deep ocean. And even the number is not super high, it's very interesting that half of this gene were not, so were not integrated in the Tara Ocean uh, gene catalog before. So that was very interesting that we covering that part of the ocean and we providing this gene catalog. And now we very recently, we, um, we release what we call the Malaspina Vertical Profile Metagenomic Dataset. So this dataset is also very unique. It, it, this catalog um, is about 17 uh, million non-redundant genes, but the, the, the interest of this gene catalog is because it covers uh, 11 stations with very nice vertical profiles uh, from covering from surface, DCM, esophagic, and batipelagic, and in each of the station, and it has between seven or eight depths. So we have a total of 78 metagenomes that is, I think is crucial to compare the photic and the photic deposition. So with all this gene catalog, I think one of the interests is to do this functional biogeography. We know many of the genes and encoding many of the process and biochemical cycles in the ocean. So if we want, for instance, to explore the, fix the carbon fixation, we know that Rubisco is a key fundamental uh, enzyme. So we can explore this gene across these uh, catalogs and, and see they are abundant across this data set. But obviously it's, it's, it's good when you have some platform that it makes you the your life easy for the people that are not, you know, experiencing in, in clusters. So that's why also the first it was I think it was interesting to to mention the the initiative also from from people from Tara to to release the Ocean Gene Atlas that integrate many of these catalogs not only from Tara but also the Malaspina uh, to explore and the functional biogeography of the plankton genes and the phylogeny. So they've been updating different versions and now is uh, is the Ocean Gene Atlas version two. But obviously this is just one, but there's also very interest and different platform for metagenomic analysis platform. Uh, you know, and, and I think all of them have uh, their, uh, their, their adventures. And I think it's really nice to have many of them as much as possible to really uh, see what is the complementary between them. So uh, there's obviously the integration micro genomes that uh, it was uh, one of the, also the first. And in 2020, it was uh, the first release of the, of the uh, Magnify that it was led by EMBL. Um, 
And uh, obviously now we have the, the key map in, two, in 2021, and now there's a new version of the Magnify that was released in 2023. So this platform will be fundamental to explore the genetic research of the ocean microbes. So that's why um, I think uh, it's, it's really nice to have this different uh, metagenomics platform. And obviously because it gives you the, the potential to explore the the, the, in, the genetic resources and, and the really broad scale. There's a many opportunities now, and you know, and, and it's a growing interest to to get profit of these genetic resources of the ocean microbes, just for for many purposes for biomass production, for antibiotics, to to uh, polysaccharides compounds, and also I will talk a little bit about two different topics that which I my my people is involved. One is um, revealing or discovering new uh, crispr cas system from from the deep ocean, and also some bioremediation process. But before that, is I think is a, just one example from also from my colleagues in, in on Tara Ocean, where they by analyzing 20, uh, 26,000 uh, max, they uh, this, they identify uh, over uh, 40 40,000 biosynthetic gene clusters, and also is um, interesting how when we merge all the data sets and this uh, you know open this collaborative um, projects, so uh, because um, they identify a new phyla, they, they call a uh, candidate Aeromyobacterota, and they uh, and it was interesting because this phyla come from the Malaspina Batipelagic Deep Ocean. So that's why the interaction of different catalogs is really, really important. And this uh, phyla contains really a high number and diversity of these biosynthetic gene clusters. The um, the other sample that was um, that my my lab is a little bit involved is in the discovery of a new CRISPR cas system. Just to remember that these cas systems are uh, immune systems of the bacteria and archaea against phage and other uh, external agents. And just to also uh, remember that it was uh, Francisco Martinez Mojica from the University of Alicante who discovered that in the in the nineties. And the, most of the bacteria and archaea genomes contains uh, CRISPR cas uh, systems in the genomes. But um, what is, has been very transformative is that this um, CRISPR-Cas system has been used for, for tools for genome editing in, in many labs in the, in the worldwide in biomedicine. And that's why the, this discovery, this transformation of this system by, uh, by these tools uh, was the discovery of uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dovna. They, they give us the, the Nobel Prize in, in, in 2020. But um, obviously, most of the lab that is using this um, uh, CRISPR-Cas system for genome editing is using uh, basically Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, and it's a very nice, uh, you know, uh, CRISPR-Cas system and, uh, and, and kit that uh, everyone can buy it. But obviously, it has different. Also, it's not perfect because first, it's a comes from the pathogen. This is Streptococcus pyogenesis pathogen. So sometimes it uh, has problems with the cytotoxicity and the home immune system response. Also because the, the very specific uh, uh, pump sequence um, also gives you a little higher percentage of, of target. It's not super specific. And also because the, the Cas9, the, the, the nuclease, is quite large and uh, intense in of amino acids. So sometimes it has problems. So is the whole world is looking for new CRISPR cas system, and uh, just um, just just mention few. There's hundreds of different examples in the now in the in the, in the literature. Just mention the one of the first that was um, from a culture microbes by data mining new CRISPR cas lossy from from microbial metagenomes, uh, discovering new cas9 from archaea and many others from bacteria. And another example is just the Cas9 from um, Geobacillus, that it was a thermophile that can that have activity at 70 degrees, which give it an, you know, new properties from, from the CRISPR-Cas tool. So this always is a very uh, interesting to, to get more and more CRISPR-Cas sequence from the environment to do uh, different things. So, but also is one thing is to identify new cas and another is validated and and that's a, uh, that's why I want to I wanted to highlight this paper because it was the one of the um, papers who really characterized uh, biochemically seventy nine cas nine 
and it was a work from from G. Edrus Casagrans, and they have uh, this company that calls CanSign, and we collaborate with them actually in our in our work. So this is a you know it's a STEM father, so not, not only identifying new uh, from metagenomics, but also to validate them. And also, uh, just uh, it's obviously that this is a business, and there is a companies that has been invest a lot of millions of of dollars uh, to get uh, you know uh, this pipeline and getting this new uh, new uh, system. For example, this is one example of the metagenomy, and they have uh, you know a lot of lot of funding to do that. And uh, but we also need to think that uh, um, discovering novel novel uh, CRISPR Cas uh, system is not only for biomedical purposes. There's a whole world beyond genome editing in biomedicine. It could be interesting for uh, agriculture, for um, uh, biotechnology, biomanufacture, for for removing path uh, pathogens. I mean, there's a whole world that is beyond the biomedicine. So that's why uh, we were our, our group to interest you uh, to uh, dig a little bit more into this deep ocean metagenomes to see if we can identify some of these uh, CRISPR Cas systems. And uh, from uh, I, as I mentioned, so we recently released this data set from from this Malaspina uh, vertical profiles, and we identify about a thousand of CRISPR Cas loci, and of those, about fifty of them were uh, have the class two system, which is the Cas9. That is the, the, the most common um, CRISPR-Cas system to use um, for genome editing. And in collaboration with CasSymes, we uh, characterize seven, the, the pump sequence of seven of them, and of them, we focus only in two of them that we call Asteris and Ovelis because they have different properties and sites. And that's the one that uh, we are going further. To, in, into the uh, validation, so we still we are in the, in the beginning of this process, and we cannot say much about that. But uh, what I can say is, um, one of them belongs into the to the you see the phylogeny of the of the CRISPR-Cas system. The purples are the Malaspina, and one of them is is clustered together with the with SPCAS9, so the the one that is worldwide used, and other is used in different. A subtype is a type two subtype B. So these two different Cas9 have different properties, and I think they will be, in, you know, inter of interest because they do probably different things. And obviously now we are in the state to validate this um, novel Cas9 in animal models. So that we have in collaboration with Dr. Theron in Edivel, that he's an expert on this technology using C elements. And the second example, very uh, very quickly, because we are almost a uh, you know, run of the time, and is the is the use of this platform, the use of this gene catalog, to also for bioremediation. So we working in a project to to detect and explore the the genes related with the detoxification of methylmercury. You know, we have a big problem with the mercury when when uh, arise from anthropogenic sources to the to the oceans. Yeah, it has. Uh, Different transformation. One is the methylation, also by 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 microbes, and this uh, methyl mercury is highly toxic. It's a neurotoxic that goes uh, uh, different goes to the to the to the aquatic food way through uh, via via accumulation. And at the end, by consuming us uh, by by consuming big fishes like a tuna, we are exposed for the methyl mercury. But also the, there's uh, bacteria that do the the reverse, so they the methylation of the mercury and now. Uh, and, and then re, uh, removing the toxicity. So that's why uh, also we are working on this line and by detecting in this gene catalog and, and see what is the, the abundance of these genes, and particularly with these two key uh, enzymes, that is the MER-B, this is the whole operon, but the MER-B, this organomicurial is, is, uh, is the responsible to the demethylation, and then the, the mer A is the mercury red taste, but it else is the mercury divalent to the mercury element that goes out of the cells. So uh, this is a, it's another way to use this uh, gene catalogs because uh, that's uh, we've been exploring in both in Tara and Malaspina, and we see the, how these mer A B genes are prevalent in the oceans, in the surface, in the DCM, and in the mesopelagic, but also in the very very deep. Um, a 4,000 meter depth, and those are transcribed.
So that is interesting. So just as a couple of samples that what uh, I wanted to do, and I think uh, um, this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thank you very much, Sylvia, for those insights and examples of the of your projects. It's it's really interesting to see the applications of of metagenomics. Um, so a huge thank you for that. Uh, and now I'm really pleased to move over and explore some of the issues that were initially discussed with Carlos, Elisa, and Sylvia in the article in a panel session, which we moderated by Professor Josep Gazol. So uh, Josep is a research professor at the Spanish National Research Council of Institute of Marine Sciences. A few words about him. He studies the role and effects of planktonic microbes in and on ecosystems, as well as how physical changes in the marine environment affect those communities. He's undertaken ocean oceanographic research across Antarctica, the, pa the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, as well as lake ecosystems in Patagonia, Canada, Africa, and Europe. He's also coordinated microbial work for the 2010 Malaspina Ocean Cir Circumnavigation Expedition and is currently head of the consolidated research group Microbial Diversity and Function in Aquatic Environments. Joining um, uh, Josette today, I'm really pleased to welcome our other panel members. So to get kicked off, Peggy Callas, um, in for an international ocean policy advisor for the Oceano Azul Foundation, where she works to promote awareness, engagement and behavioral change to protect and recover our oceans. She's an international environmental lawyer and the former director of the High Seas Alliance, where she was engaged in organizing coalition efforts at the UN to develop the High Seas Treaty for the conservation and protection of marine life beyond national jurisdictions. She's also served as UN coordinator of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Uh, next up, we have our panelist, Dr. Heidi Weiskel, who is a senior program manager for oceans at the IUCN, where she currently leads the Ocean Team of America. Prior to joining the ICN, Heidi worked for more than a decade um, at the Environmental Law um, Alliance Worldwide, which is an international NGO that provides pro bono support for public interest environmental attorneys working to protect the environment. She was also a uh, Directory of Pollution Policy at the Pew's Ocean Commission, um, as well as a science editor for UNESCO in Paris. Last and very much not least, I'm also pleased to welcome Courtney Nichols-Gold, who is a co-founder and co-CEO of New Atlantis Labs in the United States. She is a successful entrepreneur who's co-founded New Atlantis Labs in 2021 with the aim of addressing the twin challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change by providing a path to financial independence for marine protected areas around the world, aligning communities, governments, industry and individuals to improve the ecological health of our oceans. She's also created a range of successful business startups throughout her career and specializes in the development of data-driven platforms, models, products, and services. So a warm welcome to everyone. And Josep, I hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you all for being here, for organizing these, and the speakers for their wonderful presentations. I have a, a series of questions that, that deal mostly with what now which is, um, and maybe I will start with the, with, with the, the authors of the, of, of the paper and, and saying, well, what's, what's really changing because of your work? I mean, what's, what's, uh, what is what has been uh, like really new that, that, that will allow people to use it? And maybe Elisa or Carlos or Sylvia can, can give us a hand in that. Yes. Uh, um... This, this new gene catalog is, uh, of course, it's not the first work uh, of this kind. There has been, there have been uh, attempts before of doing similar uh, cataloging uh, work. But what's new and uh, how can improve in the future? First of all, uh, this is kind of a baseline work, like um, people can further explore, focus on certain aspects, and honestly develop full fields of research, we can say. For example, I didn't go in deep with my presentation, but we made an assessment of uh, microbial metabolism uh, capacities uh, and uh, only investigating that can open uh, many, many papers and many, many discoveries. Or also targeting in terms of gene clusters, uh, 
we didn't focus on this uh, on this exploratory work, but uh, exploration in terms of uh, application in medicine, applications, uh, for example, uh, for agriculture or industry improvements. So, yeah, yes. this is so, what is novel. So, in a way, the 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 catalog, what it does is like it puts uh, tools at the hands of people. Exactly. that can develop uh, maybe explore further questions or even develop applications however this uh, development of, of applications as we heard uh, from the talk by dr Azin Athenas, this is um, still i mean much it lacks much behind the catalog itself so i understand that that the catalog is just giving a tool to the people to to do something with the with the tool to develop this this further so um, my my question a little bit here is that 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 this in this case this tool allows others to come like biotechnologies for example to come to the to the field of uh, of of aquatic or marine microbiology and retrieve these sequences and and because some people may say well those are just sequences so there's nothing yeah. actually beyond the sequences and and uh, and I would like to maybe Professor Asinas can can tell us a little bit more how she sees people using the 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 catalog in 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 creating like for example pharmaceuticals or or things like that that could be that could actually uh, make uh, something or, or extract something useful from the from mm -hmm. the marine environment or the marine microbes or the genes of the marine microbes or the genes of the whole marine biota. So how you. How you see yeah, I think when I when I saw the key map, one of the things I like it is was the these tables they they have for the industrial proteins of interest. So they digest a little bit some of this kind of information for for different purposes. I think I um, it would be nice to have that for different purposes. No, uh, they have also for antibiotic resistant, but it would be nice for having a, a specific um, table for let's say the PTSs, for instance, for the for the enzymes to degrade the microplastic. So it does it something that it needs to develop further, I think. And it will probably will be nice to even to cooperate with other uh, platforms and other people. But I think it's, it's really nice. And in, in our case for the from the CRISPR Cas system, we we'll look only, only we we'll look in the in the or less uh, catalog in the in Malaspino. Because we wanted to compare, because we know that uh, all the data set from from Tara and many other gene catalogs has been already search for that you know in this in this person in this uh, company like uh, metagenomic that i mentioned before so they have a completely you know team of bioinformatics just doing data mining in every microbial metagenomes that it goes to the ena so they have the two they have the pipeline so they have all the structure so that's um, something that they have as a private but i think it would be nice to have it as a, as a public and, uh, th and that's why i think it's, it's, it's interesting that came up, you know, have this and, and this this table so for proteins of interest, but I think it can be a, you know supplemented or complemented with, with with others. Yeah. Yeah, and and and, and now that we have uh, the the, I mean, I mean that's you saw it at the beginning the map of the ocean, but would you would you think that beyond these benth examples that are not that uh, abundant, do you think that the the high seas the the open ocean has been uh, really sampled or or that uh, there should be much more work in sampling the more of the ocean or or uh, how do you see this the, i mean if we had the money that uh, that maybe they spend somewhere else in some other business which are not uh, so so interesting uh, i mean should we go back to the sea should we keep going to the sea to to explore more of the ocean how do, what's your take on that Silvia or Carlos, maybe. In fact, uh, we did a, a silly experiment, uh, which is also part of the catalog, and is that we conduct an experiment with we perturb the plankton community by adding nutrients, but you know we add nutrients and there's no spontaneous generation. So every response that we observe were microbes that were there, but they were probably too diluted to be even uh, captured with metagenomics. So we then sample and sample and sample the same community over and over. So we applied uh, nearly the same effort that was applied to the uh, Tara Oceans expedition, but with the same plant community. And we kept uh, we kept uh, recruiting 
not only more more new genes, but also more new uh, gene families to the catalog every time we sequence the co the community over and over again. So there is a we are not reaching the end of the rainbow in terms of the full catalog of genes, and probably the if we were to be done with the gene catalog, it'll probably be a, probably a hundred times more than the one that we have released already, even though it looks massive. So we are just scratching the surface. And there is a, a, a large pool of dark matter, which is a very rare uh, microbes, very rare genes that are very hard to retrieve with a, with a standard sequencing because it's like uh, winning the lottery with one number in, uh, in 10 to the nine numbers. So I think we're very far from a, a, having a complete catalog. And also one element that is almost entirely missing is the, the contributions from uh, microbes that live inside other organisms, let's say microbiomes inside holobionts, so that we are not capturing at all, uh, except that uh, some might be captured in, in uh, plankton uh, samples because we filter everything on a, on a filter and then we crush uh, and extract all of the DNA there. But uh, some large organisms may have very unique uh, microbes living inside them. And we did also uh, some years ago, another crazy experiment where we uh, sequence microbes inside the longest lived organism in the planet, which is the seagrass Posidonia oceanica. And we again applied an, a crazy uh, sequencing depth to the microbiome of the seagrass. And we found that we were uh, recruiting new and new and new uh, OTUs or, uh, or taxa every time we sample. So these are uh, a large pool of uh, microorganisms to be discovered that are members of the holobiont of other organisms, marine organisms that we have not yet uh, started to uh, to explore. And even in the planktonic community, uh, I think we need to be able to apply uh, sequencing efforts a hundred times larger than the sequencing effort we're applying today to be able to retrieve something that we can say might be complete. And do you think that um, that um, the sampling that has been has been done by Terra Oceans, Malaspina, and other initiatives in the open ocean, in the high seas, has been uh, has been enough to to provide from evidences or, or some kind of 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 of, uh, of information that may allow us to to separate some of these uh, areas as uh, as worthy of conservation or worthy of a special interest or something like that. Um, I don't know if many, uh, some of you can 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 talk about that. I mean, how should we, we, we I mean, should we uh, define these areas in the open ocean just by the presence of a, of a very large fish, or should we use also the microbes and the genes of the of the different microorganisms as a as a way of of identifying these areas that deserve a particular attention or deserve a particular care or something like that? I don't know if any of you can 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 answer on this uh, on this on this question i'd be happy to jump in there yeah i think um one of the the things that we've been thinking about with the biodiversity treaty um for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction that carlos mentioned um is that you know there there are these different areas of the ocean where we're looking um at you know these high seas marine protected areas, and it would be amazing if we could pull in these data sets and and this kind of information to inform just how unique some of these places are, and maybe there are other places that we've missed without these kinds of data. Um, and so, adding um, this kind of of information. Um, into the set of criteria that we use to look at um, areas that we might want to set aside for additional protection would be exceptional. And and I wonder if uh, if uh, I mean we have the sequence, so the sequence the sequences of the genes will be are in the databases. So who who owns the sequences that have been obtained from a a place? In the middle of the ocean, I mean, who should be, who should benefit, or how should we, should we promote that the 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 usage of a like say a CRAS, uh, CRISPR Cas system that's uh, that's um, that, that happens to be very efficient and it comes from a 
from an organism, an uh, bacterium or archaeum that was the, detected at 4,000 meters on the middle of the Atlantic, uh, where there is no jurisdictional waters of any kind. I mean, who should be, who should be benefiting from that? And is there a, a clear view how this should be? Because what I feel is that, uh, I mean, there is this effort. I mean, the scientists provide the sequences, put them on a on a catalog. And uh, the scientists, of course, do, do their part of the job, make them available to everyone, but only those who have the potential, the power, the money to develop biotechnological labs to work on these sequences may actually obtain something useful from those sequences. So how should we should we answer that? Maybe, Kurni, if you're, you're responding, yes? Yeah, well, I know uh, Heidi obviously knows very well how challenging thinking about uh, IP ownership and sharing um, that in a distributed, especially in the high seas, right? But I think the question you bring up is probably one of the most important ones because one, as you said, it's right, you start with water, then there's the research and time and money and investment that goes in by both private and public institutions to turn that water into this fine grain view, right, at a genomic level. And then there's another step that requires other participation that involves turning that into something that might look like a discovery and then a target. And then in the case of, let's say, bioprospecting, biopharma into an actual lead that might lead to a drug. And the thing that, you know, it brings up is a couple of different things. One, there are a lot of participants, so you need to set up these frameworks in advance for benefit sharing, which the BBNJ right really wrestled with for the high seas. The same problem exists, by the way, for coastal discovery in these economic zones. And one of the things I think we have seen is that when these frameworks get established after discovery, it's too late because money can, you know, let's say maybe not bring out the best in folks sometimes, that when you do that, if you haven't set up the proper benefit sharing, it will it will create a lot of conflict after the fact, which can discourage further participation. So I think setting up these collaborate, these consortiums that oversee both, you know, identifying who is contributing what to the process and recognizing the governments have a contribution to make, communities have a contribution to make, they have historical knowledge that may contribute to an understanding of how an ecosystem is functioning from observational data, not just genomic data. So there are a lot of elements that go into taking something from, you know, a sample of water all the way to something that may have IP value. And it's critical that we identify all of the participants and then set up a framework for, for sharing, you know, in a traceable, transparent way, the distribution of those benefits. And it sounds like a lot of work and it is, and it's very complex, but if we don't do that upfront, then I think we don't create successful case studies that will encourage other countries to lean in and be a part of supporting this work. Most importantly, you want there to be success stories that generate revenue because the reality is <laughs> there are all these incredible treaties, but we have a very hard time with enforcement. And that is because there isn't enough of a revenue model outside of government and philanthropic funding, which is incredible and important, but is somewhat unpredictable, right? Government's priorities change, philanthropic priorities change. And so there has not been a business model that starts to accrue these benefits that come out of the discovery across these different contributors. So it's it's such an important it's such an important thing to wrestle with and you still want to create an incentive for folks to discover things, knowing that what they may discover in their water exists in other places too. So how do you create these models, right? That encourage innovation while still encouraging uh, wide participation. Uh, so it didn't really answer your question because I think yeah. we're also no, wrestling no. with it, but, but I think it's important no. to start to yeah. identify the core tensions. Do you know what I mean? I, like what are the critical things we need to get right for this to be successful over and over and over again, which is what we need. Yeah, I think that the first step is to identify the right questions, and then and then you, you once you identify the questions and and the future problems, then you can start uh, figuring out how to how to solve them. So m maybe Peggy, you could you could answer us, or or, or how do you do you see that? How do you see that th this mapping of the genes of the ocean can help us if if it can in in uh, in uh, in promoting the the sustainable use of the uh, and conservation of the ocean? I mean, do you see? Do you see a direct way of of, uh, of I don't know identifying areas that have a, like high diversity of genes or high or high diversity of functional genes or something like that 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 can be used for for these for these objectives? I don't know. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so thank you for that question. And, and I, I will first say that I, I definitely agree with Heidi when she mentioned that this could be an extremely valuable use and, and, and tool down the road to help identify priority areas for the establishment of marine protected areas. Um, so one, you know, what, what we know is it, we do not know what we need to know about about the, the the global ocean, and this has resulted in um, difficulties in assessing risks from human activities for you know since since the beginning when ocean regulations and ocean governance came into place. That is why the High Seas Treaty first went into negotiation nearly twenty years ago it was to identify and rectify the gaps in ocean governance specifically on um, conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So sorry, it's a, it's a long you know, uh, sentence and it, just BB and J is what we refer to it. Um, but um, so, it, so as part of that, and the treaty was, as, as you know, adopted in 2023, it hasn't yet gone into force. Hopefully, we're hoping we'll get 60 ratifications uh, in 2025. And then after that, a year later, a conference of the parties will meet to then start to put into all the, the details, the many details of establishing different scientific and technical committees, uh, 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 access and benefit sharing committee, compliance committees. There is a lot of work to do to implement this treaty so that it can be successful. Um, but, but just to say that the key outcomes, some of the key outcomes of this treaty were um, a framework for uh, a, a global framework for the establishment of marine protected areas in in uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction, which um, that's actually huge. You know, sure, there, ha there are a few um, uh, MPAs in the high seas, particularly in the Southern Ocean, but they are rare. There's under 1% of the whole global ocean that are marine protected areas. And that's because this is the global ocean and everyone has to have a say in this. And so it's not just one country can create NPA. And there was no way to do that ex except for extremely long negotiations in Camelar and, and a few other areas. So this is a huge win for the ocean and what um, a global ocean uh, genome, genome can help us do is, is prioritize, prioritize where are these rare um, animals or rare um, uh, enzymes or, or, you know, uses that we haven't yet even begun to identify. Um, that's, that's really um, going to be so very helpful. And I just like to add um, where this could also be extremely useful and critical and urgent right now is in those areas that are already being um, considered for um, deep sea mining. And and it, 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 it's rather urgent, but what this what this genome can do from reading from your paper, uh, you're wonderful. And I forgot to congratulate everyone on this. It's fantastic and, and um, really quite an achievement. But um, it can track and you can and also understand what what lies in the benthic environment. Um, one of the things that came out of the article that I, I was so glad to see is that it's not as nearly homogenous as what um, is thought to be. And that's I know is working as a lawyer working on more of the policy issues, we try to tell this to governments and say, how can you start to destroy what we don't even know exists down there? And so that's so critical. And the more we have scientific um, based evidence that it's a rich environment that we don't even know what these discoveries can actually help humankind down the road um, is so very valuable. So um, yes, yeah, so that's my answer. Sylvia, do you wanted to add something? Yes, I just uh, to to follow up this this very interesting uh, conversation, and I, I think it would be really nice uh, in order to prioritize these uh, marine protected areas to have like a long term in you know, ocean sampling you know programs. So it's it's beautiful to have this gene catalog, but this is a nice shot. This is one time in uh, in, in in the ocean, and that's it. And you know you are lucky; you can go back again and go. But in order to to we know the dynamics is so fundamental. You know, we, it does exploring the dynamics, as uh, you know, also was mentioned by by Carlos, is when uh, when you sampling one or one or, uh, over the time is when you 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 see the rare biosphere coming to the to abundant and see what you know the different key micros actually uh, pumping up in different times of uh, and so that's that's I think it, it would be really nice to in order to define like a hot spot of diversity, the microbial diversity, to have this long term ocean you know sampling. Yes, go ahead, and we 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 have to 
finish, but you go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just going to add two things to both what Peggy and Sylvia said, which is just one, ultimately just remembering that these governments, you know, have a responsibility to for their citizens to be fed. And so when you, the deep sea mining is a perfect example, they have to have a reason to choose another path that allows them to generate that revenue. And that's where I think really thinking about how valuable this information is, and exactly to Sylvia's point, both this information, the genetic kind of baseline combined with time series data that allows you to build models right, eventually, models that allow us to understand how different events, how different warming events, how changes will affect the productivity of these areas will be critical, because we all know that it will get, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better, potentially, we are going to have warming events, we are going to have reduced complexity, and how can we create adaptive strategies, how can we create, but all those things tie back to revenue that's generated for these governments, thankfully, through these vehicles that get created, like BBNJ, but it's they need to see that to make different choices. And so that incentive design is so critical. That's why these treaties, that's why these organizations, but then generating revenue for enforcement becomes so important. They will do that if they understand that there is more value in protecting these things than selling a license for deep sea mining. But I think the to get there, you actually are going to need both this layer of data, but then you do need this time series data as well. And the only way to get that is for companies to have a reason to go out and do and spend the money to collect that data. So again, it goes back to tying that to some revenue generating activity uh, not in some exploitive, extractive way, but in a way that rewards improving ecological health. So maybe Heidi, you had uh, your hand up, and that will be the last uh, participation now, and then we move to the next step. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to um, highlight another really important use of um, of these data, and to complement what what Peggy was saying about the urgency of protection and, um, you know, in the context of, of the, we hope, ratification of the BBNJ. Um, but another um, really important contribution, I think, is, you know, sort of understanding better what all of these microbes and all of the, the species that are being discovered actually do in terms of their role with, with um, sort of climate stability and um, the importance of sort of regulating climate change on the planet. And I think, you know, there's so much pressure now to think about, you know, ocean carbon dioxide removal. And there's all of these projects that are that are coming up that are um, intentionally going to manipulate what uh, the current conditions are. And so having those baseline data for for what is going on in the ocean what species are out there and what their potential functions are is so critical for us being able to take wise decisions about these new industries so deep sea mining is one but the the whole um up and coming industry of of ocean carbon dioxide removal um so that information is really critical and 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 these data sets are such an important contribution to our better understanding of that Okay, thank you everyone for your responses and giving the the word to Gilbert and he's gonna he's gonna continue from now from here. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Josep. That was a really engaging, a really engaging panel. Um, and I think Heidi, you've actually set set the scene to to move over to our Q and A with some questions about the next steps because there's a lot happening here where you know it's a very critical time. Um, and the global ocean genome will be absolutely key to help us uh, with climate change and loss of biodiversity. So that's great. So um, we've had a lot of questions um, and I am trying to sift through as many as possible, but I'm going to kick off with the importance of, of, of the future and the next steps and ensuring that we can share this information. So we've got a lot of uh, greater contributions to, to the ocean global genome. There are very many programs out there. So a question, and I guess um, this can be for, this is very much open. Um, from someone called Elva Escobar, how can we contribute to this ocean genome if we have large long-term sampling programs from the deep sea benthic realm in marginal seas? Uh, I don't know whether someone would like to take that. To Elisa? Oh, did you put your hand up? I don't know if that was, if you want to. No, yeah, so, sorry. Brava, off, off, yes. over to you. Yes, I can take this one. Well, how to contribute? Uh... Of course, uh, first step, uh, as we explained in the presentation, is making this data available. There is a huge lack of uh, samples from the Bantic realm 
is less than 5% in our data set. So the more data is retrieved, especially from Thai series and is made available, the more can contribute to our uh, gene catalog. As uh, says the name, this is uh, the 1.0 version. So there is already a plan of making comparison with land and, uh, and uh, increasing this and publishing this uh, in a broader version because the cutoff of these samples is already becoming a little bit old. Of course, we needed to make choices when uh, we, we release the first one, but uh, yeah, published, uh, published uh, as much uh, as we can on the Bentic Realm. We stressed a lot on the discussion, the importance of having further efforts toward this, uh, this uh, habitat and make the sequences available and hopefully we're going to include them in the next release fantastic crowdsource crowdsource as much as you can um and on that i've got a question from someone called Kara layton and this is also for the authors um she understands that your main interest is in understanding broad scale patterns of biodiversity with a focus on functional diversity and microbial communities but could you explain how this platform could be used to better understand taxonomic diversity at the species level. I don't know if someone takes that. Yes, Sylvia. I think um, for the species level, it's very tricky. I just coming just from from a single you know gene catalog. I understand that, but I think uh, we are now coming to the age that. Uh, with a new uh, sequencing platform uh, with the long reads, we will be able to really get these gene catalogs implemented with very long reads, with nanopore, with PathBio, and go to, you know, with the, with the, at the level of the species. Probably we are not ready at that point with the, with the current technologies, but we, that's why we're, it was uh, also very interesting to do max because when you uh, using the power of reconstruction uh, metagenomic assembly genomes, we can just go and have a, a better resolution. Yes, not only about the taxonomy, but also about the, the functional capacity of the, of the taxa. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, and I see we are, we only have uh, 10 minutes left. So I'll ask one final question, which will be a lot broader and it's a little bit out of context, but I hope this will be a nice positive note for us to, to work towards. Um, how can international cooperation and coordination be enhanced to address global challenges such as climate change and biodiversity loss through marine genomic research and its implications for policy and decision making? Um, so I'd like to open that uh, if anyone would like to tackle that first. Courtney, would you? I see you smiling. So would I like to uh, hand you the mic? Uh, okay, I think my answer would be just about the public-private um, combination, that public institutions and public research combined with private industry, I think typically has been the most potent uh, solution set for super complex problems, because public institutions are very good at, uh, I think, distributed problem solving, at longer term thinking, at uh, this deep research, and private industry is very good at risk taking, at thinking about, um, I think, new business models at incentive design. And so combining, I think, uh, the efforts of both public and private will be critical to solving this problem and setting up a, business, a new business model for incorporating all of this research, turning it into value and returning that value to communities and governments that we need to protect these areas um, for our collective benefit. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Courtney. Um, would anyone else like to share their thoughts on on that? Oh, Heidi, yes, over to you. I could I could say something quickly about that. Yeah. So I think um one of the the hopeful um pieces of the BBNJ is, you know, it's it there's a lot to be worked out. Um, and so you know, the first conference of parties will be extremely important, but the benefit sharing um committee that that is meant to sort of really think about what we'll be doing with the revenue that comes from these discoveries. Um, it, it's meant to go back into capacity building and really sort of be used among all of the countries. And so there is, you know, a, a, I think a very high, high-minded, high-spirited 
um, truly inclusive um, effort there behind behind the treaty language. And um, it'll be really interesting to, to see if we can realize that. Um, because as Courtney has said, just the, the potential for the revenue is really high. Um, and we want to, it would be amazing if, you know, we haven't been able to necessarily do this in other contexts, but if we could do it with, uh, in the context of the BBNJ, and have true true capacity building benefit sharing among among countries, um, it would be a pretty hopeful step for us. Thank you, uh, Josep. Josep. Yeah, I would like to add that um, we are talking about oceanographic research. Oceanographic research has been uh, has been um, characterized by by a sense of sharing for a long time. So I can now go and go to the Argo boys. Um, and see what's the ver vertical profile of, of salinity in the ocean anywhere in the world. And I did not pay, or not my country or my institution did not pay for the for the voice that are there giving this data. So the sense that that uh, we all benefit from the work uh, that everyone is doing, I think it's very much into the the our minds and the minds of all the the people working on marine research. This said, I believe that the next step has to be our our uh, uh, commitment to the transfer of of uh, of uh, knowledge based capacity building of everyone who would like to to participate who would like to to jump over and i would like um, to 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 also share the concern that or share the idea that we should uh, do that the companies that are trying to explore and exploit materials from the ocean should also learn from this from these benefits that we all get from from sharing the data that others have collected, that they will also get the better benefits, and uh, everyone will get a better, better better benefit if they think also in sharing their their knowledge to to everyone that can use it. So they would they would be benefit by sharing the knowledge, not by hiding it. So that should be also a message. Wonderful. I think that's a really positive note to 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 end this Q and A session. Thank you very much, Josep. Um, I we've reached the end of the discussion today. Um, so I want to thank everyone for for the questions that come in. Um, Carlos, I see you've uh, you've managed to 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 join us. I'd like now to turn to you for a few closing remarks. Um, potentially talking about the, the the critical next steps for this research as you see it. Also thinking about what we spoke about capacity building, um, and international cooperation. So, yes, I, I leave it over to you to give us a, a few minutes to share your wisdom. Yeah, thank you, thank you uh, for that uh, opportunity. In fact, I think that uh, one of the things we need to reflect up upon is what benefit sharing actually means for the global ocean genome. Because I think there's been a lot of uh, misguided uh, insights into that really reflects sharing some sort of economic value. But in fact, in my opinion, it's more sharing the capacity to find the needle on the haystack. So what we have uh, delivered through this catalog is the haystack, but now we need to find the needles. And the needles actually depend on the question in your mind and the application in your mind. So that's where capacity building should focus, but also in developing the open biotech pl platforms that are able to make use of those needles. So I think that's the next uh, the next step. And also, also uh, we are just scratching the surface. So there will be uh, a lot more, the haystack will become a lot larger and the needles will become many along the journey also because our questions and applications keep changing. So I don't think we will ever finish this research, but that's the beauty of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, very enlightening few words. Um, so I'd like to give each panelist 30 seconds to give a few final thoughts that you'd like to share as take home messages to our audience. Um, so can I please start off with Sylvia? What would you like to share? Well, to me, one uh, message will be collaboration. Uh, I think we are, uh, as a Pep mentioned uh, uh, scientists, and we love collaborate. We like to work together. I think this uh, gene catalog is is one. There's many others, and the, the same the, the this uh, metagenomic platform. And it would be nice to really find one space to really meet together and maybe uh, try to coordinate something more integrated. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Joseph. Well, I basically basically said said it in the, in the, in the previous 
in the previous uh, question that I or answer that I gave. I think that uh, that uh, this gives us, I mean, uh, putting together the work of others uh, and 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 make a, a, a step forward into organizing and putting together the work. This has to stimulate everyone else to do similar work, to add to the catalog or create a new catalog with a thing that is more useful in another way so that we all benefit from the work that everyone does. And I think, I mean, it's, it's sequencing is expensive and, and, uh, and, uh, and the kids are for DNA extraction are expensive and going out to see, to get the samples is very expensive. And that's the reason why it should be not uh, kept on, on drawers or it should be not on the desk or my hard drive, hard drive at home that someday our kid can um, drop the soup on top of the hard drive and all these, all these samples will be lost. So they have to be in a data repository in a place like the catalog where everyone can use them and everyone one can benefit from them. Open data sharing. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Josep. Peggy, over to you. Thank you, Gilbert. I, I um, Just coming from this, I, I feel that, um, I really feel that the uh, Global Ocean Genome can be a, a gateway to start that collaboration and that policy scientist interface that's really so needed to um, ensure that the ocean remains um, healthy and sustainable, which is what we all want. But again and again, I would just implore all the scientists here please share your data, please get your studies out because this is more um, valuable to policymakers than you can imagine and really does make a difference. Um, and, and thank you all for all, all the hard work and, and your time away from families on these big cruises and doing this work. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. Uh, and Heidi. Yeah, I think I'm I'm so inspired by this increase in knowledge and awareness, um, both you know, sort of in the technological side and the advances that that we're making, and then on the the biological side. Um, and I'm aware that that with this increased knowledge also comes increased responsibility um, to nature and the planet, all of the marine species, and to each other. And I hope that we can balance these needs as we go forward. Fantastic. Thank you. Courtney. I would just say uh, to Carlos's point, the introduction of this uh, additional haystack, which presents the opportunity for more needles to be found, uh, in my mind represents maybe one of the greatest opportunities we will have to transfer wealth back to the communities and governments that actually live and protect uh, these critical habitats that we all now know we rely on for our collective survival. So uh, to me, that's actually the most exciting thing that these discoveries create the foundation to create a new business model and one that I hope will allow countries that have smaller GDPs to participate, the ones that cannot write big checks to fund big expeditions to do this research, that they also can benefit because they are the ones that actually are protecting these areas that we rely on. Very inspiring words. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and last but not least, our uh, uh, co-author, lead author of the article, Elisa, what would you like to share? Thank you, Gilbert. Yeah, following on uh, Professor Duarte and Courtney's closing remarks, I would say that the keywords are uh, fair and equitable benefit sharing. We saw how much can arise from this uh, type of work but we saw also how multidimensional is the administration is from many point of view, administering uh, all the steps of this process. There is, uh, I also want to, of course, this came out in the panel discussion about uh, the management, but I want to stress the necessity of, of still having baseline research. We are exploiting right now habitats which have not been fully addressed, for example, the deep sea. Deep sea, we need baseline studies. We need uh, to define a full framework of uh, fair and equitable benefit sharing arising from them and also of protection. So we need to treat the ocean in a multidimensional way from many point of views, from uh, a low one, from a diversity management and uh, yeah, from uh, base science. So, Thank you all for contributing to this and for being here today. Thank you very much, Elisa. Thank you, everyone, for your final words. Equitable sharing, data sharing, it's, it's, these are the key words we're hearing from today. Um, so I, 
I want to just have a quick, um, say a quick thank you to all of you for joining our speakers and our expert contributors. So thank you to Carlos, Elisa, Silvia, uh, Josette, Peggy, Heidi, um, and Courtney. And also thank you to all our audience members who joined today. I really hope you enjoyed the session as much as I enjoyed moderating it. Uh, please do visit the Frontiers in Science website, read the article we've discussed today and its hub of content. You can continue the conversation on social media, as I mentioned, hashtag Frontiers Forum. And please also subscribe to our Frontiers in Science newsletter via the website. The link is being posted in this chat as we speak. And do visit the Frontiers Forum website to view any upcoming events. Lastly, a short survey will appear on your screen at the end of the event. And what have you got to look forward to? Um, we'll be holding our next deep dive session very shortly. Please do keep an eye on the Frontis Forum website for more information that's coming. So from for now, from me and to all of our guests, a huge thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Yes.